We've got Keith Wood with us. We may as well go straight to Keith. Keith, good morning to you. How are you? Morning, Chair. How are you doing? Well, it was uh, a chastening weekend for Leinster as once again they reached the semi finals of the European Cup. And it looks like the build up has been good. Most of their players are back from injury at just the right time. And they run into a physical buzzsaw again. It's, it's, it's not the same as the Saracens' defeats, but it feels pretty similar. Yeah, it does. It seems very similar. It was uh, I was left with with a thought uh, at one stage, and I don't want to talk about Munster in terms of this so much, but it often looks like Munster scarred by playing against Leinster, that they often seem to not come up with the right plan. And Leinster seem a little bit scarred by playing against uh, a very big pack of forwards, uh, as if they, they don't quite have the tools to get out of it. And and yet it looked very, very promising in the first 10 or 15 minutes where, where Leinster took the lead and looked to be in total control, dominance in terms of possession, um, and then maybe didn't get the scores that they needed to get to try and keep that ticking over to put real pressure on La Rochelle, because what happened in the last 60 minutes of that game was pretty much a, um, a display of... Uh, not the normal way that La Rochelle play, actually, but a display of uh, power, skill, patience, accuracy, and um, and a lot of the things that Leinster would be famous for, and and they weren't able to deal with it. The the breakdown was a, a massive issue. The number of turnovers that Leinster conceded, where somebody just got in over the ball, and there wasn't a, in a support player quick enough to make sure that the picture given to the referee. Was sufficient for him to allow play to continue. Um, I have, I don't remember Leinster being killed at the breakdown in in such a similar way. Maybe that's the difference from the Saracens game. And I, I don't understand. Is that is that connected to the physicality, or is it a byproduct of it, or is it actually a separate issue entirely that needs to be addressed differently? Um, I think there are a few different parts in that. Actually, I thought the referee was very pro Leinster for the first half an hour. Um, I thought his interpretation at rook time. Um, he wasn't getting that across to the French team. And um, it, I think it took up to half time for them to try and get an understanding about exactly what it is he wanted. And they came out flying with that in the second half. Uh, look, I was struck by a couple of different things in, in the game. One is that in the last number of years, um, Monster in particular, Ireland most definitely, um, and now uh, Leinster have, when they're being put under huge pressure at ruck time, uh, when they're being put under huge pressure with a fast defensive line, they revert to either kicking the ball away or they revert to the 10 standing back too far and uh, in a standing place, catch and pass. And that just increases the pressure. So you're not getting over the gain line because there's no real incisiveness then in the back line. So when your forwards are having pressure, you really need your 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 backs to get onto the front foot themselves as much as they can, which is very difficult, but they need to be more incisive at that stage. Uh, I felt Ross Byrne went back a bit too much. Um, he started, he was standing and passing. Um, and I told McGrath, uh, thought McGrath kicked far too much of the ball away, you know, and it wasn't being, um, it wasn't being effective at all. And what La Rochelle did was they put a huge number of guys under pressure. Not everything went their way either, and yet they looked incredibly comfortable as the game went on. They looked like they were holding all the cards. How do you fix that? Um, it's hard to fix it straight up because if it was easy, it would have been done before. Um, I do think we need to. Um, I think we need to challenge the defensive line. I think we need to have players running on harder lines off a of flatter ten. I think that's something that's essential. I think we have to stop the one-out runners. So I think a mixture between that and pods of three-one-three three in the back line can change things up a little bit. Um, I just feel that we, we are getting suckered slightly into the idea that the only way to play rugby is with huge forwards. Uh, we're not huge, and it is a way to play, and it is a bloody successful way. But if you don't have them, I think you just need to play a little bit smarter and faster. And, it, and that's the difficulty, because if you're not able to win your own rock ball, um, uh, it it becomes, or you're not able to do it really, really quickly. It's very hard to play very fast after it. But 
that's the that's the key is pace we're not huge we just need to be we need to be faster we need to play a bit faster and i remember looking at something years ago i think i was i might have been playing myself or it might have been just after playing that i became convinced of the idea you should you should be playing almost two sevens and two nines everything you possibly can to get the ball moving quickly is is something that turns big people around the field but I was stunned, actually, by some of the quality of La Rochelle. Like, Nick Skelton played for the 80 minutes. He was better in the last 10 minutes than he was at the start. That's extraordinary for a guy of his size. And But they're big players, and I'm not saying just physical big players, but they're big players all delivered on the day. Um, I didn't think Leinster's did. I think some of them coming back from injury, um, just looked a little bit shy. For why they'd be shy in confidence, I, I don't know. But um, they just, they looked shell-shocked for a lot of the game. It did seem, Keith, say, over the last couple of years, whenever we've analysed Ireland, that we've pointed maybe to deficiencies in Ireland's style and said, why can't Ireland do what Leinster are doing? And, and, and from what you're saying there, there's a lot of this that's reminiscent sometimes of, of the national uh, lack of creativity or, or an inability to create opportunities. Is it simply because Leinster look good in the Pro 14 because they just outpower teams week in, week out. Is it, is it as simple as that? Um, I think they do outpower teams, um, definitely. I also think that they have a lot more space, and with space you can do a lot. This is a recurring theme for things that I would say all the time. Um, if you give people space, they have time on the ball, they can make the right decision, they can, they can uh, enact the right pass or the right feint or whatever. Um, if you look at the manner in which a lot of the teams that are being more successful at the moment, now oh, they may have more money and they may have more resources. Um, but Leinster are, Leinster are a fantastic team. And um, uh, I felt that with a bit more accuracy in the first half, if they'd got a bigger lead when they had more control of the game, I think it could have been closer. But it almost looked as they tightened up as the game went on because they weren't getting any respite. I look, I thought La Rochelle played played brilliantly well. And I you know, this is the first time that they got into a semi-final. I think you have to applaud the manner in which they went about the game. Um, um Batia, who got injured in the center, is one of my favorite players to watch. And he didn't get a he, we didn't get to see him play at all of any note. And yet he's one of the most exciting guys. And La Rochelle played a cup style game they didn't play their they kept the ball alive but they didn't keep it alive for 80 minutes they kept it alive for little patches of the game i thought it was a, it was uh, i thought they played with a great control i mean look sexton obviously wasn't available and wasn't going to be available so it wasn't like it was a last minute thing from Lance's perspective was there a significant difference in not having his experience on the field when maybe some of that kicking in the second half, particularly when Leinster could do nothing to relieve the pressure, it was all essentially kicked by the nine and there was nobody saying, hang on, maybe we need to try something different here. Of course, of course that could be the case and uh, probably was the case, but I think we have to stop those conversations. You have to, you have to deal with who you have on the field at the present moment in time. I thought Ross Byrne, in, in my view against Exeter, just thought he, I, th I thought he was getting there. I thought he was taking the ball flatter. He was um, uh, beginning to probe an awful lot more. And he got smashed a few times for it. And that's what you're going to have to do as a 10. So, um, but I felt uh, he got deeper again. And I look, I, I thought the forwards got fairly roundly beaten up at different times. I thought Leinster suffered very heavily when Ruddock went off. I still think he's the most underrated player we have in Ireland. Um, I think he is a guy with bulk and I think he does, people say he's not as flashy or whatever, but I think he does a huge amount of work and I thought uh, Leinster suffered when he went off. Um, but it looked um, uh, it looked as if they almost got deflated by, by, by the constant flow of the game. You know, it was, it was constant. I thought the La Rochelle halfbacks just played really, really well. And it was, now it was easier for them to play well. They're on front foot ball. And, um, but it is that mixture of playing with big forwards, but big forwards who are trying to release the ball out of their hands means you never get into the defensive position and never a good defensive position. And there's only one guy hitting a rook instead of uh, two guys getting in there. And it just, um, 
the game just drifted away to you know to be honest and look um Ohio West is is a fine player but he rarely kicks as well as he kicked at the weekend and he was again pretty phenomenal and you know when when you get a penalty and it keeps ticking over I mean again I still think the breakdown is annoying there's too many penalties that are being given there and some of them I I couldn't understand on both sides I really couldn't so that's not something that Leinster can just fix the breakdown thing that's part partly to do with the refereeing of the game partly to do with just the ebb and flow of, of a superior team it is, but it's also maybe maybe that becomes part of the system that you have to have that you you're almost hunting in twos and consistently Leinster have been tackling in twos, one high, one low. But that maybe not necessarily what has to happen now. It may be one tackler, one poacher. You know, it's it's how do you how do you go about that? That if somebody is willing to offload, offload that you get yourself into a position where you can tie this up. It's much easier said than done. Of course. I mean like I th I thought it was a like it was uncomfortable watching um and yes it was a great game but with some phenomenal play and like really phenomenal play but look four of the best players on the field were in la rochelle's pack you know uh, uh bougarit uh, vito aldrich and skelton were phenomenal you know i mean phenomenal and if it wasn't one there, it was the next. And they were either over the ball or carrying a heavy carrier, making a big hit. And um, I just think they did a huge amount of work. What about the, the coaching imprint on, on La Rochelle then? What, what did you see on Sunday? Well, I think, I look, all the chat has been about Raj and uh, it's been totally, you know, this constant mm. uh, element. And... Of course it is because he's you know he's one of our own we want to kind of see him do well and there's always conversations going around on the other side of it um i would say for the most part he's gone about his his coaching career fairly quietly he does work in the media and that some people seem to find some level of offense with that but he's entitled to do all of those things um but i think he's building his resume just step by step by step and um, I think he also remembers what it was like as a player and the pressure for the pressure that tens can be put under and how you can affect them very, very heavily. He knows what that was like because he wasn't the biggest guy at 10. And I think he's enacting a defensive setup that puts tens under a huge amount of pressure. There also isn't a lot of places to kick. Towards the end of his career, like Raj was the best guy for finding a piece of grass to bounce a ball and to touch. But at the end of his career, the French. deeper because of it now you look at his defensive system there's a lot of that at play there also John O'Gibbs knows Leinster backwards you know he was there for for quite a while um he understands the structures he understands the mentality I mean if you're looking for a perfect combination of the two people who could dismantle them there was their biggest rival and one of their coaches so uh, look I think they got an awful lot of things right one point about the the um, players that you've spoken about there as well, um, and the quality in particular of the foreign imports that La Rochelle have. In the grand scheme of things, the Irish rugby team at senior international level is the top of the uh, pyramid, the word uh, du jour, and that's always going to remain the case. How important is it that we get teams that can win the European Cup to breed the winning confidence? and? As such, do we need to look at some superstar imports to try and get the club teams over the hump that they're at at the moment? Um, I Look, there's a couple of things in this. Everything is cyclical, and that's not to d diminish what's happening at the moment. Um, I am a huge believer that we need to be concentrating as much of our resources on the youth as we possibly can. Um, I'm a huge believer we should be putting money into the All-Ireland League because I think it's essential because some guys mature a little bit later and that's a great um, breeding ground for players. It's the second conduit in, um, from, in, in, as with the schools. Um, and I think there are things that absolutely need to happen. If you look at the players that we talked about in La Rochelle, we're talking about guys who have decided to retire from international rugby and um, they get a decent wage packet 
but they are dedicated then to that club and they're not going off to play somewhere else in, in a World Cup or in an international window. They're just, they're not available for selection. They're the guys that are at world-class level or at, at international level, really good international level that fit the bill. But they're also the guys that fit the bill for us in the past. So we looked at uh, Issa Masewa, who was just essential for Leinster for so long. You look at Brad Thorne, he'd finished, uh, Rocky Ellison, um, Jim Williams, Christian Cullen, um, um, you know, all those players that were able to dedicate a huge amount of time and attention to clubs, it was partly because they weren't playing international rugby. They are the right guys. They are the right level that we want to have. And we do want to have a couple of world-class players. I don't mind having a couple um, that are presently playing, but, you know, you need, you're going to pay them a lot of money. You need them there for the time that are there. So those guys are bringing a level, like I often talk about um, John Langford with, uh, with, with, with Monster. John Langford's glue that he that he he brought to the Munster squad in 99, 2001 and two was incredible. He was always there. So when the international Irish international players went away, you had this guy who who had an incredibly as I as I described before your world class attitude, um, and he was there all the time, and um, I think the, an awful lot of the players learned a huge amount from him. And I think that there's great value in that. So Leinster should be allowed to invest in some world-class talent if that's what they feel they need to do to get over the line. Yeah, but in my view, it's world-class talent that will be there. Like, they've been really good at us in the past. You know, if you, what we want are players that if you are taking one or two players in, that they're going to be there when... Like, we, we know, like, Leinster are almost um, suffering from their own uh, huge... Uh, conveyor belt of talent. So we look at uh, at an Irish team and suddenly two thirds of the Leinster squad are gone into the Ireland squad. Then you have the next crew, crew that are in there. Now they're brilliant talent. I mean, it's lovely to watch the players that are coming through Leinster, but you need a couple of senior souls in there to try and help them understand what it's all about. And you learn an awful lot from your peers. It isn't just from your coaches. So like I've I've heard Brian O'Driscoll talk time and time and time again about the hard edge mentality of um, Rocky Elsom and Brad Thorne, that um, that there always was an edge there, but that edge was there when the guys were off playing for Ireland, it was still there. So I think they're the type of guys that you're looking for. So we barely talked about them, but Victor Vito has shown a level of explosiveness, capability, capacity. Um, and he is showing that every week of, of the year for La Rochelle. You know, he's not going off for 12 weeks to go and play and coming back tired and jaded. I mean, I think they get the balance right. Just one final point on the, the Champions Cup as a whole then, Keith. Is it a, you say everything's cyclical, but is it a trend that we're going to see over the next little while? The, the Toulouse, La Rochelle type final, the French sides dominating this competition? Um, I, don't, I don't think so. I, I, I actually think um, it's funny. There's been there's been conversations in in a, in a couple of the papers in the UK this morning about American buyers looking to buy Leicester for sixty million. Um, uh, there's different conversations of other people coming in. Um, that's fine, only that there isn't that much money in the game as of this moment in time, and. Uh, I know that at any period of time, like four years ago, they changed the EPCR because it seemed as if the Irish teams were winning everything, you know. So these things kind of, they do go and it does change. And um, uh, I can tell you that the budgets were huge in France when they weren't here in times past. And we're looking at Toulouse. Toulouse are aristocrats in the game but they haven't won the competition in 11 years. If that doesn't show you a sign of, of cycles, I don't know what does. So um, I don't panic yet, but I do think we need to look at, uh, at how we can maximise what we can do. So that becomes pretty important. It's Lions Week. Are there any yes. Irish players who will be particularly fretful or have they all, all the senior ones, done enough to 
and have enough credit in the bank. We, we know Warren Gatland likes to stick with his tried and true. Look, I've, I've looked at this, and I hate picking lines, um, squads during the year. This is the only time I actually want to make a guess at it because it all depends to what happens to the last weekend. Um, I don't see as many on as I've look again. I've looked flipped over some of the papers over the while. Um, um, I think Furlong goes. I think Ty Byrne goes. Um, I think Ryan should go, but he may not. And being out injured, and especially with the concussions, has um, uh, always puts it out. Um, uh, I think Murray goes. I think Henshaw goes. I think Hugo Keenan might go. Um, I still have been consistently interested in his trajectory. I think he's done really well. Um, I also I don't know about Johnny Sexton because I think getting um, getting um, injured again. I think that puts it out, and I'm not quite sure what the story is over the bubble that goes down there. How easy it is to get new players to come out. Um, this is going to be a very unusual tour. I still think there's a risk over the tour. Um, if if increasing numbers in South Africa change the fact that the tour may not go ahead, so I don't know. Um, I think there's an awful lot kind of being thrown up in 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 the air, and I know that a couple of people have decided not to. Um, a couple of people have decided not to go on tour. Um, ben Youngs has decided not. Uh, whether there's any more that will come out of that. Um, I also thought that if it was a normal tour, I thought uh, Kelleher would have got an outside bolt or chance. Um, but there are only two midweek matches for this. So, yeah, I, I don't know that you can say that everybody has done perfectly well to get there because, um, uh, look, I think it's a... Uh, it's an abridged version of a Lions tour, and I don't. It'll be like no other Lions tour, and um, the idea of building guys, bringing them into a squad, and getting the best out of them over a period of time to perform for a test series at the end, is unbelievably difficult in these circumstances. I do think um, Gatlin will go with more tried and trusted people he's worked with before, people who offer something that he thinks might fit in. Um, characters that he think will be very good tourists and so you may get a couple of players who could be better players but may not be in the position because they may have had injury they uh, I think resilience could be a huge thing uh, mental and physical um, I just think it's an I look it's a, what a horrible um, decision making process that the Lions coaches have to go through this week is tried and trusted going to be the way he goes captain wise as well um, I th well, look, I think so. I think uh, it's funny because I looked at Alwyn Jones playing in the autumn and he looked like an old man. Uh, he was hobbling around the field. He didn't look, he didn't look um, fresh. He looked to all of his age and all of his caps. And I thought he was absolutely magnificent in the Six Nations. So um, he can get up for it and he can get there for it and he's a guy I think that everybody would want to follow I mean from every I don't know him particularly well I've met him a couple of times but um, he seems to have the credentials he has of course he's the credentials but he also has the will and he seems to have the body to be able to do it he doesn't seem to be that broken he looked broken nine months ago, he looks energised again now, and maybe it's because this could be his swan song. Uh, Keith, there's a question here from Pascal on YouTube. Do you think Sexton should just rule himself out and take the break, maybe extend his career a season? That's a very interesting question, and I, I don't know, because I don't know the... Um, I don't know the advice he's getting and the medical advice he's getting uh, with it. Um, they've obviously told him to take a bit of a break. Um, um, I also don't think that Johnny Sexton knows us anything. I think he has delivered for us for a huge amount of time in any jersey he's worn. So I'm, I'd be kind of happy enough um, that he could stop whenever he wanted to and be incredibly proud. I just don't want him to get any more hurt. So, but it, that comes down to a, a medical view, really. This could be his swan song. Um, he may want to go. Um, if he feels up for it and fit for it, I can't see him ever stepping away. And I, 
I, I know people kind of, some people struggle with the concept of the lines. I struggled with it this year because of the pandemic, but not for any other reason. It is the absolute highest altitude of performance for, um, for a rugby player on these islands. And um, every player will want to go. And now there may be reasons why you don't want to be in a bubble for that amount of period of time. And that's absolutely fine too. And, um, you know, it's, um, I, yeah, it's, it comes down to a personal decision. But um, look, I know we're going to have to start, we have to start dealing with the fact that he doesn't play forever and won't play forever, you know. And um, I don't think we've, we've got our head around that properly yet. Yeah, look, I think that point that you make there about the, from a player's perspective, if it was the choice between extending your career or playing in the Lions, I'd say most players are going to play in the Lions, right? Uh, I think so, actually. Um, it's funny, my father uh, got uh, um, pulled himself out of the tour in 1955, which was an incredibly unusual thing. He was a young man, he just started a new job, and he decided that he wouldn't go on tour. And he did tour in 59. Um, which I think is surprising in some respects because often if you pulled yourself out, you would never get picked again. But um, uh, in this particular case, you're looking at like a World Cup is a four-year cycle. The Lions is two months. That's that's the truth of it, you know. And like I can't see Johnny Sexton at the next um, at the next World Cup. I just can't. But. Uh, the lines is uh, only a few weeks away. And did your dad regret not going in '55? Do you know what? He never told. He never spoke about it. I only found out. Uh, his brother told me um, about four years ago. I never knew that story until about four years ago. Wow, I'm sure he's pretty glad he got picked again afterwards. I'm Otherwise, sure he was. it yeah, might have sure been. A, um, what did I do? Yeah. yeah. Keith, great stuff. Thanks a million. Cheers, gents. So Keith Wood giving us some insight there. The Lions, obviously, on Thursday, we'll be going big on that and we'll be, uh, obviously, keeping you abreast of the games as well.